fans, in this installment of Spring Tips, we're going to look at Cloud Foundry. Now, Cloud Foundry is an open source platform. It's meant for uh, cloud-based applications, naturally. It's, a, it's optimized uh, for applications in particular. That is to say, uh, while there are other lower-level concerns that are present in every application stack, uh, these are not as visible uh, as you might expect them to be if you've come from lower-level components like uh, an infrastructure as a service offering, something like Amazon Web Services or Google Compute Engine or uh, Microsoft Azure, etc. Right? These are these services are primarily uh, sort of focused is focused on um, uh, allow, allowing you to rent and then work with and, and, and manipulate servers, right? Uh, the uh, the bits and 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 uh, pieces associated with servers, so hard drives, RAM, CPU, etc. Those kinds of capacities that you care about at that low level are certainly there, but we don't care about them when we deliver the most important thing, which is uh, business value, application functionality, right? So Cloud Foundry gives you the ability to automate away a lot of that lower level stuff by focusing on a specific type of application, an online transactional sort of uh, application. By transactional, I mean it does requests and replies. It's an online application. Um, and it's a, in, in, in particular, it's an application that is uh, stateless. So of course there can be some state if there needs to be, but that state uh, is typically held somewhere else. And, and if you have state, a complex state, um, as you would, for example, in a custom uh, database, then Cloud Foundry uh, isn't, the, isn't necessarily the easiest uh, or most, most correct way to, to run that kind of application. If, you want a, if you're trying to build a stateless web application or a service or something that uh, handles requests that in turn talks to a stateful service, that's a great fit for Cloud Foundry. But uh, you know, Cloud Foundry itself is not optimized for running databases. It's optimized for running applications. Uh, and there are ways to connect services, backing services, things that hold state, like message queues and databases and caches and, and so on, uh, into Cloud Foundry. Now, uh, Cloud Foundry is open source. Like I say, it's a, it's a part of a foundation. In fact, it's managed by the Linux uh, Foundation, the very same foundation that manages the Linux open source project. Uh, it has uh, a lot of different contributors from all around the ecosystem, all around the industry, uh, including uh, HP, for example. Uh, I think Baidu's in there. Uh, certainly Pivotal is in there. IBM is in there. So these are companies that have all taken the original open source Cloud Foundry code, which... Uh, those of us at Pivotal and previously at, at VMware developed, and uh, they've, uh, you know, joined in the initiative. They joined in the effort. Some of these companies have their own um, Cloud Foundry offering, right? They have their own implementation that they uh, they package and ship and sell and so on. So, so Pivotal, uh, the company for which I work, of course, uh, has its own distribution called Pivotal Cloud Foundry. Um, the the distribution, that particular distribution, is a on-premise offering. That is to say. You get the box uh, and well, the proverbial box. Obviously, it's a, it's a download, but uh, you get the the software license. You get the the bits, and you can install it anywhere you want. And then you have your own sort of private cloud. Uh, it can run on uh, vSphere. It can run on uh, OpenStack. If it, it can run on Google Compute Engine, it can run on Microsoft Azure. It can run on Amazon Web Services, etc., etc., etc. So uh, you can deploy it on any of these different infrastructure layers. And applications that are written for Cloud Foundry will run portably across all these different layers. So if you are an organization that wants to move to the cloud, but maybe you haven't yet made the, the leap to a uh, sort of a public hosted uh, cloud environment, uh, then you can install Cloud Foundry and get the sort of velocity that moving to a cloud environment gives you uh, in your own local data center. And then when the uh, time comes for you to move to public cloud, uh, you're ready. Just install it there instead, right? It's the same platform, same everything. In fact, you can have, uh, you know, it's very easy to have hybrid sort of uh, configurations where you have a local private data center uh, sort of clouds and publicly hosted clouds as well. Now, the 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 thing we're going to look at today is called Pivotal Web Services. This is a hosted implementation of Cloud Foundry. It's, it is just regular Cloud Foundry. Uh, it's deployed on Amazon East, so it's, on, it's running on Amazon Web Services, uh, and it's not private, right? When you get an account on Pivotal Web Services, it's a multi-tenant environment. Uh, obviously, it's secure. You know, with, you know, apps aren't supposed to see each other and all that. But in theory, you could be sharing um, a computer with some other application, right? Uh, it's a great place to start your journey with Cloud Foundry, I think, because it's very, you know, it's very, very um, uh, reasonably priced. It's cheap for for small sized applications and reasonably priced uh, thereafter, um, and it doesn't require you to 
to uh, lay down a cluster, right? Lay down a whole topology. You just get an account and start uh, using it. So we're going to build a simple application first, uh, just a regular Spring application, a data-centric application. I'm going to call the CF Data Demo. I'm going to use uh, MySQL. We'll use the web support, REST repository support, actuator support, uh, and uh, I think that will do, oh, and JPA. So we'll use JPA as well. And uh, we'll hit generate, give ourselves a new zip file here. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to just store some data in a MySQL database. Uh, and the reason we want to use MySQL is because that's actually one of the many backing services that we can use on, on Cloud Foundry. So uh, we need to, in our application, create some data. And uh, I think we'll just manage some cats here, right? Cats are fine. So we'll use some uh, cats. Uh, create an entity. Okay. Private long ID. At ID. Private string reservation name. Create a constructor. Uh, at generated value. Okay. Create another constructor. This one with uh, JPA. All right. There's that. And uh, maybe a two string. Good. And what we want to do now is we want to save some data in the database. So I'll create a a command line runner and uh, in the command line runner we'll uh, initialize some sample data by using the uh, a, a reservation repository which we're going to uh, create using spring data so reservation repository uh, rr okay and then of course we'll let the uh, we'll let the uh, id do the work here okay so there's this extends jpa repository uh, for type of cat here we are. There's my mind. Cat repository for type of cat. Okay, and uh, there we go. Now, what we want to do is inject that into the constructor. So there's this, and we'll save some records into the uh, into the database here. We're going to say uh, stream dot of and we'll Felix Garfield. Uh, you know, what's an, um, Tuppins. Okay, so we'll go through those names and uh, for each name we'll write a record to the database using our, our cat repository here. Good. Now, this is going to run and talk to a uh, MySQL instance. So we need to configure a few things accordingly. We're going to uh, say spring dot data source. Well, first JPA dot uh, uh, database equals MySQL. Right there's this, and uh, JPA. Uh, I'm gonna have it create the schema for us on the startup. And uh, what we want to do is want to create, um, want to configure the connection to our local, uh, our local uh, database data source. Okay, so we're gonna say um, that we want to configure connectivity information in the default profile. So if there's not another profile specified, it'll use this one. So here we're going to say data source uh, dot username your username equals cats and uh, we'll use password is cats as well. And uh, we'll say that spring dot data source dot URL equals jdbc colon mysql colon forward slash forward slash localhost uh, forward slash cats question mark use ssl equals false for now and uh, that should do that should be the the mysql specific information to talk to the cats database on this node uh, so if we start this up the only thing we're going to need is a rest api um, in order for this to be interesting so we'll go here to our um, repository and annotate it accordingly uh, this isn't strictly speaking necessary because we have spring to spring boot started at rest on the uh, class path and we've got a public type so let's go ahead and and kick it off and see what happens OK, 
Okay. Local host eighty eighty forward slash reservations. Whoops. Seems I forgot to specify the correct database there, so we'll try again. Okay, now, there's our application, cats. There's our cats. So now, we've got an application. It's up and running. It's writing to the local database. Uh, we're ready to go to the cloud, right? We've got a very simple application. I don't want to linger too long. Uh, but this is a typical sort of Spring Boot application, right? Uh, it's using a backing service. That is to say MySQL. Uh, the application itself is a REST API or a single page app or, or even an application with session state. But we'll look at how to cover that in another discussion later on um, when we look at Spring Session. But for now, uh, we can deploy this. So let's go to our command line here. Okay, and we'll do maven minus d skip tests clean install. cd target cf push minus p. And what we're going to do now is we're going to push this application to the cloud platform. Now, again, we there are many different versions of Cloud Foundry. There's no such thing as the one true Cloud Foundry. Uh, and so I've got an, a jar file here. I want to log in to my uh, Cloud Foundry instance. I'm logging into the Cloud Foundry running on on uh, run.pivotal.io. So normally you're going to specify when you do CF login, you're going to target an API endpoint. Uh, the API endpoint I've already targeted. It's API.run.pivotal.io. But if you're using some other cloud, or uh, if you're or if you're using your own cloud, it might be you know API.yourenvironment.com, for example, right? Um, either way, we're going to target that endpoint, uh, and I'm going to log in here. I'm going to authenticate. So put in my email and uh, specify my password. And once, I'm, once I've done that, I'm asked to specify which organization I'd like to work with. And now, this is, in the, sa this is the same way as uh, you can belong to many different organizations on GitHub, for example. Right? Uh, you, you don't have to, um, you can use one tool and, and one, uh, one uh, username and password and so on for multiple organizations inside the, uh, the account that you're, you're using. Right? So I have multiple accounts, multiple organizations that I belong to um, on Pivotal Web Services. Now, that done, I'm going to specify number two, Platform Engineering. And voila, I'm logged in. I'm logged into this space. Uh, and now spaces are um, uh, a way of sort of partitioning off work flows or, you know, work environments. So you might have development Q&A, you might have staging, whatever, for a given uh, organization, right? And this is a great place to um, to do kind of uh, isolated testing as well. It's a good place to, to sort of scope the deployments that are in the application. All right, with that done, I have no applications. I can confirm as much by going to CF Apps, and I see that I've got two existing applications that are stopped, right? So not, none of these are working right now. They have no instances. They're not taking up any memory. They are bound to URLs. And what I want to do is I want to push my application, but I want to push it uh, once I have created a... Um, uh, a data source. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to push it, but I'm not going to start it first. I'm going to say uh, CF market, or I'm going to push it, but you know I'll push it and start it after I've created a service. Actually, that, that's that's probably a, a better idea. So what we're going to, what we're going to do is we're going to do CF marketplace. We know that I need my SQL. If I tried to push the application right now, uh, this wouldn't work. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the marketplace here and wait for the catalog to uh, stream down here from the hotel. Now this catalog, this marketplace is just a sort of, it's just that, it's a catalog of different backing services that you can use to to um, enrich the behavior of your application. Uh, and there are many different options here. So what I want to do is I want to use a, a uh, MySQL implementation. And so I can use ClearDB. I can say that I want to use the, um, the Spark plan, that's the free plan, of the ClearDB My, uh, MySQL service. And then I need to give it a logical name. So I want to say uh, CF create CF create hyphen service 
and it's going to ask me for what information. So I'll say uh, Spark, ClearDB Spark, and then I'll give it a logical name here, and I'll call it My MySQL, right? So what that's going to do is it's going to create an instance. It's actually going to go out and provision a database. Now these different plans, you know, they don't mean the same thing across all different services. Uh, you could have, uh, you know, these are arbitrary definitions, arbitrary names um, for these different services. These services are typ on, in, on pivotal web services that are provided by actual third-party uh, web services, online services that happen to have an integration with the uh, pivotal web services platform. So we can't, you know, we don't control the prices for their their offerings, right? They're just given different labels, and uh, the billing is handled if you if you choose a different plan, and that's already just sort of built into your account. Now I'm gonna hit CF Create Service ClearDB Spark My MySQL. Now what I want to do is I want to push the application, so I'm gonna say CF Push minus P, and I'm gonna specify uh, the cat application here. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to give it a logical name. I'm going to call it CF Cats, you know, data uh, demo. And before I do that, I'm going to do a dash dash no hyphen start. And that's going to push the application into the cloud platform. So it's going to what's going to happen is it's going to upload that that jar file, which is a, just a zip file, and it's going to try and understand what kind of application uh, it's being given. It's going to uh, run it through a series of tests. It's going to try to figure out what kind of application it is. In this case, it's, it'll see it's a jar. Okay, great. It's a, a Java application. Uh, it's got a main method, so it's a Java application that can run a main method, and uh, it'll it'll then lay down. Um, you know, it'll it'll do everything it needs to get that application uh, ready to use. But it's not going to uh, like start it or or kick it off just yet. So, what we want to do is we want to bind our Recently created, uh, recently created um, backing service, the the MySQL instance here. Two are newly created or newly pushed applications. So we're going to say bind service, uh, and then it's going to say that we have to bind the app to the database, right? So the the app is called CF Cats. and I'm going to bind it to my MySQL. CF Cats demo to my MySQL. And what this is going to do is it's going to create a a, a sort of a, a link, if you will. Uh, the way that services work in Cloud Foundry is that uh, the um, information about how to connect to a backing service is exposed to the uh, application as environment variables. And these environment variables are um, uh, you know, visible to the, to the application that we're, we're trying to use. So we're going to say, uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, launch the application. The application will look at the environment variables. It'll then understand that the connectivity information that it needs uh, for, uh, for the MySQL instance or for RabbitMQ or for for an email server or for cache or for whatever is in those environment variables. It'll pluck them out and then use those to configure uh, the sort of data source or message queue or, or whatever that it's trying to connect to. So this is a, a nice pattern because it means that I can change the application. I can do whatever I want. And as long as I'm able to uh, unpack that configuration, that those environment variables and apply it to my, my uh, infrastructure, my middleware, my, you know, my bindings to data sources and so on, uh, then, then it doesn't matter where I get those environment variables, be it on my local machine or in the cloud environment or you know the CI server or whatever. Uh, and even better, um, since we're using Spring, Spring's in an enviable place to sort of hide the extra bit of indirection required to support that particular sleight of hand. Right? You can do you can do um, different kinds of configuration, and it's just in the Java Spring configuration. It's not in your code. Uh, and then you you can uh, you know your code is none the wiser. It doesn't know or care where that data source came from. If it's a, an embedded data source on a local machine, but it's a MySQL instance running on Cloud Foundry, uh, you know, who cares? Okay, so what we did was we uploaded the application. Um, the, the platform is going to see that it's a Java application, like we said. 
it's going to run a series of, of build packs. Now, these build packs are, uh, the, these are the default set of build packs that are provided in Cloud Foundry, uh, and they only provide, you know, they, on, they provide just a, a well-known set of build packs out of the box for Java, for .NET, for Go, Ruby, binary applications, PHP applications, etc., um, Python, Node.js, but but these are, are uh, ultimately, at the end of the day, they're just directories full of scripts and well-known positions that get executed uh, in a certain cycle. When it's when the application is being pushed into the cloud, we detect which build pack uh, to then assign to the application. In this case, it realizes that it needs to use the Java build pack. And the Java build pack then takes the artifact and it downloads and lays down a file system that contains everything that's required to, to run this application, a Java Spring Boot application. That file system uh, is going to be automatically created for us brand new from scratch. So there's no sort of crufty state being kept or anything like that. This is a mutable infrastructure, right? The recipe for creating that file system is in the build pack. And if you don't like our particular recipe, then you can provide a custom build pack. But the benefit of using build packs is that uh, we now have a standardized template for building uh, you know, an image of something that will run a Java application, an image that will run uh, something that will run .NET, for example, whatever you want to use uh, that build pack. Uh, can do that for you. Once the file system has been created, from just you know examining and working with your uploaded artifact, your your jar for jar file in this case, um, it will create a container, and it'll deploy that container across the cluster and, and make it available uh, to traffic. And it gave it a gave it a URL as, as well. So this is the default URL that we've been given: cf cats demo cfapps.io. If I go here and go to res or, or rather cats. You can see the data is there, and it's running in a cloud application. If I go to um, ENV in my application, seems my browser plugin isn't working. Uh, instance index, here we go. You can see that it says instance index equals zero, right? So that means that there's one instance of the application available uh, for consumption right now. Now if my capacity, if my demand should double tomorrow, if I, uh, if my application shows up on on Reddit or uh, or you know in the old days we talk about slash dot, uh, then I want to be able to handle that upgrade in capacity. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to scale up. I'm going to say uh, that I want to say uh, cf scale minus i to cf cats demo. So I'm scaling it. to two instances. I'm scaling the uh, I count, the I parameter, to two instances. I could also scale the disk. I could scale the memory. I could uh, do all sorts of things here. But what I'm actually doing I'm, is I'm telling the platform to take the existing container that it's already built for us and then just create a new instance of it somewhere. And so uh, if we give it some time here, just a few seconds, uh, it will see it eventually start to load balance. So right now it says that we've got on the instance index it says 0, 0, Zero. One. So there's our there's our application instance. Uh, if we keep going, zero, 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 one, etc. Right. So it's it's going back and forth, uh, and it sees the updated values. Um, it's now load balancing the work across two different nodes, and we can even configure auto scanners so that if there's more of the traffic than we can handle, it'll automatically look at, for example, the memory and the CPU and so on, and scale up based on those metrics. Now, this is one way to interact with the application. We can see that we've got uh, CF services, right? This shows us the service that we've created. We've got the CF apps. Uh, and, you know, we, we can also see how easy it is to push an application and so on. But sometimes you want to uh, look at the con look, look at the data itself in a more sort of human-friendly way. So. We're going to go to the console on run.pivotal.io itself and log in and we'll see our applications. Good. Now I want to use Pivotal Web Services. And I'm now logged into my account. This is uh, showing me that I've got so many different apps in each of these different um, uh, organizations. I'm going to choose the right organization here, Platform Engineering. And I can see that I've got three applications. 
two of which are stopped, one of which is running, started up a minute ago, it's got a gig of RAM, two instances running. I can click on this to get the details, visit the application. I can see the services that I've got, you know, provisioned and, and specified here, uh, and the plan. You know, I can change all of this stuff here as well, change the uh, settings, maybe rename it, whatever I want to do. And, um, and, you know, there's that as well, right? And, of course, one of my um, uh, favorite views on this is the, uh, the sort of information that you get in PCF metrics here, right? So if you click on metrics, PCF metrics gives you a real-time sort of analysis of traffic going into the application. It shows you the requests, the errors, all that kind of stuff. And it shows you a sort of correlated view of the logs as well, right? The request logs. So you get a lot of information. Uh, just by pushing this application, you get a built-in dashboard. You get a lot of sort of interesting information that you want to know about the app, the application, the app, the containers that are running the application. All that stuff is here, uh, automatically provided for you live, right? And this is interactive, so you could look um, at very very small granularities, very large ones, and so on to get this in, this kind of information. And this is all just by virtue of the fact that we pushed an application that we had just built on start.spring.io. Now, one question you may be wondering is, how does it know? to which database it should be writing. I, I configured the uh, MySQL instance on the local machine and uh, then I see I've pushed it into a cloud platform and suddenly stuff is still working, or at least it seems to be working. And you may be wondering how that's going. So what happens is when Spring, when rather when Cloud Foundry sees an application of a type that it recognizes, in this case Java, uh, it does uh, rewriting, if you will. It does whatever it can to um, replace different kinds of definitions, you know, data source definitions, in the incoming artifact. In this case, it, um, it replaced, it rather, in this case, it, it uh, programmatically adds a bean factory post processor that replaces any spring beans for type, uh, of type data source with one that it creates for us automatically that points to the correctly configured uh, my SQL instance running in this Cloud Foundry uh, environment. So this is this works great if you are uh, if you have one MySQL or one RabbitMQ and it's unambiguous as to which uh, you know backing service should be uh, should be applied or you or connected to. But if you have more than one, then it becomes very useful to be able to disambiguate. And for this, we have the Spring Cloud connector. So if you go to start.spring.io and you look at the connectors, these connectors will provide that extra bit of indirection. They're a programmatic sort of spring Java config friendly way of uh, uh, hydrating different data sources and random queue instances and message queues and whatever, um, and, and you know caches and so on, and whatever based on the type of object that you want to use, and then pointing it to a, a backing service by the service ID name, as opposed to hard-coded usernames and passwords and, and hosts and so on. So with that, we have an application. Uh, it's in the cloud. Um, we can get visibility into what's happening here. Uh, we've looked at how to scale it up and so on. Now, we can also look at the logs, right? So I showed you the logs there, but it's one, one thing you should uh, appreciate is that the, the logs here are being multiplexed for us automatically. So I can say CF logs. So there are the logs for the requests that have been uh, sent into our application. We can just tail them like this okay so if I make some requests here line this up there we can see the uh, information being routed through both instances uh, you know in one log one log stream you can configure custom kinds of backing services called a, a syslog drain and a drain is just a, a service that, exp that speaks the syslog uh, protocol, you know, from Unix, and uh, then accepts the logs that are being uh, generated from this multiplexer. This is called the logregator, and it's just another component in Cloud Foundry. If you're using a drain, you can you can specify any, you know any valid syslog D endpoint like Elasticsearch, like Paper Trail, like Splunk, etc. And this information will just automatically appear in that backing service uh, for you. All right, so now we've got an application in production. We've looked at how to sort of uh, add a backing service. We looked at how to build an application that can be pushed into the cloud. Uh, we looked at some of the operational tools and the observability tools that you get. Uh, and so I hope 
you now have an appreciation for what's possible here. I'll, there's a lot of uh, uh, velocity that you can get by using something like a Cloud Foundry. And this is great because it means that high-performing organizations that want to get to production and want to worry about the, the most important thing involved in their organization, you know, the most important thing in their organization, which is writing software, they can focus on just the software, in this case a Spring application, which is very, very uh, productive, uh, and, and worry not about the sort of the stuff before that, right? The, um, the setting up servers and, and you know, configuring CPUs and Linux kernels and, and security and all that stuff, right? All right, so thank you very much, and I'll, uh, I hope you enjoyed this, and I hope we'll see you around.